The birth of a child is a beautiful moment that most parents eagerly anticipate. However, sometimes the arrival of a child can bring unexpected and astonishing circumstances. For children, born with severe deformities, left people initially surprised. When 24-year-old Ricardo Caron returned home from Peru, he couldn't believe his eyes upon seeing his daughter for the first time. He held a newborn that resembled a mermaid. With only a portion below the waist and feet that looked like fins of a mermaid tail. Shocked. The parents decided to rush the baby to the hospital. Ricardo. Carrying the newborn. Boarded a bus heading to the distant capital. Lima. The girl was born in a remote area. And the father had no idea that such a deformity even had a name. This deformity is known as Sirenomelia. Also called Sirenomaly syndrome. Children with this condition have legs fused together. Sometimes with feet that resemble fins. Most children with Sirenomelia either perish at birth or shortly after. Besides fused legs. These patients often experience late-stage deformities or missing organs. In the hospital in Lima. Ricardo Karen was still speechless to learn all this. Doctors provided treatment for the little girl. And to their relief. Discovered that she had all the leg bones inside her body. This provided an opportunity for future surgeries to separate the legs. Ricardo and his wife Sarah named their daughter Milagros. Meaning miracle. Through donations and the work of volunteer doctors. Milagros' miracle eventually became a reality. She underwent her first surgery at the age of five months. Milagros' story spread widely across Peru. And her parents were grateful for the support from people nationwide. She underwent multiple surgeries. With rapid recoveries each time. Spending joyful moments singing and dancing in the hospitals. Milagros and her parents were often invited to special events. Drawing attention from experts worldwide to this unique Peruvian girl. Thanks to help. Milagros enjoyed many happy years. Her parents and doctors knew she had only one functioning kidney. Which eventually led to her unfortunate fate. In 2009-2010. Due to kidney failure. She suffered a stroke and passed away. A similar fate befell her two siblings. Who also passed away relatively early. Born in New York City in 1988. She died in 2016 at the age of 28. The third child is Carlida. Who passed away at the age of 10. Despite the impossibility of separating her legs. In 2009. In the unit. Ed states. Her 35-year-old mother was not happy when holding her fifth child. Almost as soon as the midwife showed her the baby. The mother felt scared. The child's deformity was peculiar. With protruding eyes. An open skull. Resembling more a frog than a baby. This woman from Bihar. India. Initially refused to hold the baby to her chest. Believing she had given birth to an extraterrestrial and requested the doctors. At the hospital. Doctors diagnosed this extremely rare Charcot syndrome. This disease actually affects the skin, causing certain body parts to develop in very unusual ways. In the case of the baby in Bihar, a part of the skull was missing, exposing a portion of the brain, and the entire head was extremely short, accentuating the prominence of the eyes. In the mother's village, people deliberated on how to handle the birth of such a child. In rural India, where superstitions prevail. Influenced by the Hindu environment of the mother. It was decided that this baby must be an incarnation of the deity Hanuman. Usually depicted as a monkey. And associated with human spiritual or physical abnormalities. Surprisingly. The mother accepted this notion and eventually embraced the little boy. It is currently unclear how long this baby will survive. Charcot syndrome causes the skin to gradually thicken. And as the child ages, the skin becomes tough and rigid. Children eventually suffocate within their own body or, or pass away before organ failure. By that time, the little boy may be enjoying his life as a deity, with the mother and child becoming the center of worship. Since his birth in 2017, many people have made pilgrimages to witness this little monkey deity. When Kabir was born, those around her were also shocked. The girl actually had two heads. Appearing frightening. The midwife and father decided not to show the mother the child temporarily. Kabir was a set of conjoined twins. 
with heads not directly adjacent but seemingly growing out from the abdomen. A few days after birth, parents from a village in northern India traveled four hours to Jaipur for an examination. Photos and ultrasound images quickly revealed that Kabir's body had grown a second head. The twins might have suffered severe deformities in the early stages of pregnancy, akin to a parasite attached to Kabir's organism and allowed to develop. Although this second head lacked eyes and sensory organs, it had hair. Since Kabir couldn't share organs with the parasitic head, she underwent surgery Q. Titude towards her child is admirable. However, other cases are heart-wrenching and dramatic. What are your thoughts on this story? Could you love a child with such severe deformities? Do you think it would be better for these children if they were not born? Next. There's an another similar story. Let's expect what will happen. Marilyn harbored dreams of marriage since her kindergarten days. Influenced by her mother's belief that it was the key to a woman's happiness. Despite a tumultuous upbringing marked by constant familial discord, even amidst an unhappy family environment, Marilyn steadfastly held on to the notion that matrimony and motherhood were paramount. After her mother's passing, Marilyn's home life became increasingly unbearable with her father's remarriage. Eager to escape her cruel stepmother, Marilyn aspired to marry quickly and embark on a new, happier chapter in life. While studying at medical school, she encountered John. John, a tall and brown-eyed guy with guitar-playing skills, was the life of the party and the object of affection for many girls. Initially oblivious to Marilyn, who presented herself more modestly than her peers, John eventually recognized the charm of the quiet girl labeled a gray mouse by friends during their final year of study. Following graduation, John, a commuter, returned to his hometown and took a job at a construction site that offered higher pay and less responsibility than his field of study. Despite Marilyn's weekend visits and anticipation of a marriage proposal, John seemed in no rush. However, his parents, fond of Marilyn, encouraged him to make a responsible decision. In due course, they arranged a wedding, and Marilyn's dream finally materialized. Freed from the harsh treatment of her stepmother and her father's indifference, Marilyn entered a new chapter in her life, now having her own family and a cozy nest in a rented studio apartment. Marilyn relished being the mistress of her own space, where she didn't have to accommodate anyone but her husband. Of course. Marilyn found joy in caring for him, creating a comfortable home, and preparing delicious meals. However, it wasn't until she became pregnant that she noticed John's indifferent and detached attitude. Rather than expressing delight at the news of their impending addition, John constantly reproached Marilyn for perceived mismanagement, leading to frequent quarrels. As their daughter Amy was born, things took a turn for the worse. The demands of an ex. Ost wife and a perpetually crying child left John increasingly distant, seeking refuge at his parents' house more frequently, to exacerbate matters. His parents, who once adored Marilyn, sided with John and showed little interest in their granddaughter. Undeterred by the challenges, Marilyn clung to hope, believing that John would eventually come around. Unfortunately, the situation deteriorated further leaving her to face the trials of motherhood alone. Initially, John stopped contributing financially to the household, revealing that he had become entangled in gambling and sports betting, resulting in significant losses, including his parents' pension. During this tumultuous time, John met Caitlin, a wealthy woman twenty years his senior, in a managerial position at the construction company where he worked, having missed out on romantic adventures. Caitlin embraced the flirtation with the young builder, eventually becoming romantically involved. Caitlin assisted John in settling his debts, showering him with expensive gifts and treating him to lavish meals. Unashamed of his infidelity, John remarked on the generosity of women like Caitlin. Unable to endure such humiliation, Marilyn decided to file for divorce. John, uninterested in his wife and child, offered no objections. He didn't even bother collecting his belongings. As his new lover took care of dressing him in expensive brand name clothes. While John reveled in a carefree life, his former family struggled to make ends meet. His parents turned their backs on Marilyn and their granddaughter, 
offering no support. Faced with financial hardship, Marilyn realized she had no choice but to return to her father's house. The same place she had left years ago with joy and hope. Deciding to return to her hometown and start anew, Marilyn envisioned a fresh start for herself and her daughter. As she packed her belongings, she convinced herself that everything would be fine, and her father would welcome his little granddaughter. However, reality proved to be unsettling. Upon arriving at her parents' house with her baby in her arms, Marilyn was met with a less than cordial reception. Her father, upon seeing her on the doorstep, was too surprised to utter a word, while her stepmother immediately displayed a displeased grimace. Instead of a warm greeting, she inquired about the duration of Marilyn's stay. When Marilyn revealed that she had returned home for good, her stepmother flushed with anger. Despite her attempts to m maintain composure, a range of emotions was evident on her face. The stepmother nervously moved around the apartment, slamming doors and drawers, while her husband tiptoed after her in an effort to calm the situation. Fatigued from the journey, Marilyn paid little attention to her stepmother's feelings. Her immediate concern was to settle down, feed her little girl, and perhaps take a nap. However, when she opened the door to her room, she was greeted by bare walls and piles of construction materials. Her comfortable bed, large closet, fashionable desk, and cute pink curtains, all discarded. It became apparent that her stepmother had initiated renovations starting with Marilyn's room, seemingly intent on erasing all memories of her stepdaughter and severing any ties to her past. Forced to inhabit an empty room with only an air mattress, Marilyn's stepmother made it clear that letting her stepdaughter and the baby sleep on a soft bed in the bedroom or even in the living room was out of the question. Displaying her displeasure, the stepmother went as far as neglecting to feed Marilyn's stepdaughter. In response to Marilyn's reproachful look, the father merely spread his hands, offering no support. Despite being too tired to address the situation, Marilyn knew her rights. As the heiress of her late mother, she was a co-owner of the apartment and had every right to be there. Instead of engaging in an argument, Marilyn went to the kitchen, made tea, took a shower, and settled down to sleep with the baby. In the quiet of the night, Marilyn woke up and went to the kitchen for a drink of water. To her surprise, she overheard an intriguing conversation. The stepmother expressed resentment, questioning why Marilyn's father hadn't informed her of their daughter's arrival and why he hadn't dissuaded her from coming. The father, unaware of the situation, justified himself, claiming he knew nothing about it. He made it clear that he had no intention of cohabiting in the same apartment, anticipating endless cries from the baby that would give him headaches. The stepmother insisted that Marilyn should live there for a while, and they could discuss the matter later. However, she emphatically declared that they had already begun renovations, and Marilyn's father had to talk to her the next day. Hearing this conversation through a crack in the door, Marilyn slipped back into her room, attempting to go unnoticed. The fatigue that once weighed heavily on her lifted like a hand, making G it impossible for her to sleep until the morning. Marilyn grappled with thoughts about her father's potential actions. In her heart, she hoped that he would stand up for her and ensure that she and her granddaughter wouldn't be forced to leave. However, the realization dawned on her that this weak-willed man might not dare to defy his authoritarian wife. Determined to stand up for her rights, Marilyn reassured herself. As the morning arrived, a timid knock on the door signaled the entrance of Marilyn's father. Without offering a greeting or inquiring about her sleep, the man began to mumble inarticulately. He suggested that Marilyn might have overreacted in leaving her husband, citing that such things happen in life. Couples may experience issues but eventually reconcile. He urged her to come back, emphasizing the importance of not leaving a child without a father. It seemed the man wanted to express more, but he was cut off when his wife entered the room. Evidently, she had been standing outside the door, listening to the conversation between father and daughter, recognizing her husband's ineffectiveness in the matter. She took it upon herself to set the record straight. I haven't heard a word from you in years. You never remembered your father and me. And now you show up and disturb our peace. No. You're an adult. 
you can live on your own. We have our own rules. And there's no place for you and your child here. Blurted out the stepmother. Clearly pleased with her eloquence. Just hours ago. Marilyn had prepared herself to fight desperately for her place in her parents' apartment. She had planned what she would say to the mean stepmother. However, as she looked at this greedy woman and her father, who was hiding behind her, all the words escaped her. Marilyn felt a sudden wave of disgust and couldn't bear to stay under the same roof with these people for another moment. Without uttering a word, Marilyn packed her things and left. She cast a reproachful look at her father but he shamefully averted his eyes. While Marilyn wouldn't leave her apartment if she had nowhere else to go. Pride aside, she wasn't foolish enough to wander the streets with an infant. She knew there was one place in this world where she would be welcomed with open arms. And no one would ever point her to the door. A few hours later, Marilyn found herself on an electric train heading towards the village where her grandmother lived. In her childhood, Marilyn's mother often took her to her GR and mother's house since the family couldn't afford trips to resorts. Marilyn spent her summers and vacations in the village, experiencing a simpler life. Mrs. Spruill, Marilyn's grandmother, visited the city infrequently, as she disliked her son-in-law. After her daughter's death, she refused to set foot in the house, blaming her son-in-law for her daughter's fatal illness. During Marilyn's years as a student, she became engrossed in her own affairs, leaving little time to visit her grandmother. Their interactions were limited to occasional phone calls. And despite Mrs. Spruill's invitations, Marilyn never made the effort to visit. Now, in a desperate situation, Marilyn realized that her only option was to turn to her elderly relative, whom she had ignored for far too long due to her youthful selfishness. Upon arriving at her grandmother's house, Marilyn hesitated to enter the yard initially. She observed Mrs. Spruill sweeping the cobbled paths in the garden and noted that she hadn't changed much in the few years since they had last seen each other. Despite being almost eighty, the elderly woman remained energetic, active, and looked younger than her age. Marilyn's thoughts were interrupted by the sound of a baby crying, bringing the elderly woman's attention to the gate. Who's crying? Mrs. Burrell exclaimed shielding her eyes from the sun and squinting to get a better look. As she recognized Marilyn, the elderly woman rushed to hug her granddaughter and then escorted her inside the house. Seeing Marilyn with a child in her arms and a suitcase, Mrs. Burrell, who had seen much in her long life, understood everything without the need for further questioning. The elderly lady was thrilled to have such dear guests. While she was upset for her granddaughter's struggles at such a young age, betrayal from her husband, becoming a single mother, and being rejected by her own father, Mrs. Burrell was still glad that Marilyn was by her side, even under such sad circumstances. After the death of Marilyn's mother, Mrs. Burrell had barely seen her granddaughter and was worried about the absentee father's ability to care for the girl. Now, Marilyn would be supervised and surrounded by care. Furthermore, Mrs. Burrell living alone in the big village house, looked forward to having more company and assistance with household chores, caring for the house, garden, vegetable garden, and even the poultry had become challenging as she grew older, and having a strong young woman around would make things easier. Mrs. Burrell believed that Marilyn should continue her studies, thinking, let her study, anyway, after my death, all this will go to her. In her grandmother's house, all of Marilyn's worries dissipated, and her despondency disappeared. The care and support of her elderly grandmother proved beneficial. And in a couple of days, Marilyn came to her senses. Marilyn radiated cheerfulness and happiness. As if the troubles of the past months had never happened. The baby thrived in the fresh air and the care of her great-grandmother. Sleeping well. Being cheerful and active and quickly gaining weight. Marilyn seamlessly adjusted to rural life, learning from her grandmother how to grow fruits and vegetables and take care of chickens. The duo even started selling their crops at the local market. Marilyn made friends among the villagers. And loneliness became a thing of the past. Life continued. 
and it seemed to Marilyn that this happiness would last forever. However, five years later, grief visited their home. Mrs. Spurl contracted severe pneumonia, leading to serious heart complications. Despite efforts, the woman never fully recovered. Once cheerful and lively, the pensioner rarely left the house and gradually weakened. Practically bedridden, sensing her last days, Mrs. Spurl decided it was time for a serious talk with her granddaughter. Although the elderly woman went to bed early and lacked the strength even to watch her favorite TV series, she waited until Marilyn finished her chores and put Amy to bed. In a solemn conversation, Mrs. Spurl discussed the future with her granddaughter, offering instructions to avoid repeating old mistakes. She then revealed her inheritance plans. It turned out that Mrs. Spurl had visited a notary long ago, even before her illness, bequeathing her house and modest savings to Marilyn. The most precious item, however, was in a beautifully carved box that the elderly woman handed to her granddaughter with a trembling hand. When Marilyn opened the box, she discovered an incredibly beautiful antique gold ring in the shape of a flower with a large ruby in the center. My great grandmother received this ring as a gift from her husband, and they lived a long, happy life together. Since then, it has been considered the talisman of our family. From generation to generation, the ring has been passed down the female line, bringing good luck and happiness to everyone, explained Mrs. Spurl. Intrigued, Marilyn asked why T. He ring wasn't given to her mother when she got married. Mrs. Spurl replied. Because she chose the wrong man. My foolish daughter. She wouldn't have been able to keep the ring from her foolish husband. And he would certainly have sold it. By morning. Mrs. Spurl had passed away. Leaving Marilyn deeply shaken. Despite the support of neighbors and friends. She felt quite lonely in the empty house. To avoid going crazy. Marilyn decided to get a job. With a medical degree. She took up the role of the local paramedic, as the previous specialist had left for the city. Although the local medical office operated only a few times a week, Marilyn's efforts ensured that the villagers had access to medical care. The salary of a rural paramedic was meager, making it challenging for Marilyn to support herself and her daughter. To supplement their income, Marilyn continued to tend to her grandmother's garden and sell fruits, vegetables, and eggs at the market. While modest, the income was sufficient for Marilyn and her daughter. During a business trip to the city, Marilyn found herself near a jewelry workshop and became curious about the value of her grandmother's ring. The jeweler examined it carefully and quoted a surprisingly high amount. If Marilyn sold the ring, the money would be more than enough to move to the city, pay the first installment on a mortgage, and considering the historical value, a collector might pay a fortune for it. Despite the temptation, Marilyn decided not to sell the ring, unwilling to betray the memory of her grandmother. Instead, she chose to wear the ring, finding comfort and hope for a happy future in its beauty and significance. Six months passed, and Marilyn inherited her grandmother's estate, becoming the full mistress of her house. Balancing work at the nurse's station with household chores helped her gradually recover from her loss, and life seemed to be improving. However, one cool fall evening, an uninvited guest shattered Marilyn's peace. Persistent knocking on the door led her to believe it was a sick neighbor seeking help. To her unpleasant surprise, she found John standing on the doorstep. Marilyn didn't immediately recognize him, and the sight of her ex-husband revealed the toll the years of separation had taken. He had become gaunt, developed a beer belly, and was bald. His appearance hinted at a lifestyle dominated by drinking. There was no shame or embarrassment in John's gaze. As if the betrayal and five years of separation ha. Huh? D never occurred. Initially frozen in surprise. Marilyn's hidden anger and resentment boiled up. While tempted to slam the door in his face. She reluctantly allowed him in when he pleaded to talk. In the kitchen. John didn't show interest in his daughter. Amy who was luckily staying at a friend's place that night. Instead, he launched into the sad story of his life. Initially, the romance with his new lover, Caitlin, seemed perfect. 
John even contemplated proposing to establish a legal connection to her wealth. However, Caitlin had different plans. Tired of John's intrusive behavior, she realized his romanticism was driven by greed, not genuine feelings. Ending the romance, Caitlin moved on to another man, a mature and successful businessman. John, unwilling to accept the loss, pursued Caitlin relentlessly. Caitlin, determined to put an end to John's pursuit, took decisive actions. She fired her ex-boyfriend and filed a police report, accusing him of harassment. Left at a broken trough, John returned to his parents' apartment, where he resumed his old habits of drinking and gambling. He accumulated debts, leading his parents to sell their summer house and an old car to cover the costs. However, this situation failed to sober up the negligent son or prompt any change in his behavior. Seeing her son's downward spiral, John's mother believed that marriage might be a solution, thinking that some woman could potentially control him. Despite John's undesirable state, unemployed and plagued by alcohol issues, his mother recalled his former daughter-in-law. Convinced that Marilyn, facing the challenges of single motherhood, might return to John if beckoned, his mother suggested the idea to her son. Intrigued by the prospect, John decided to search for his former wife and soon learned that Marilyn had likely gone to her grandmother's village. John, attempting to reconcile, reasoned with Marilyn, expressing thoughts that their separation might have been in vain. He suggested starting anew, emphasizing the comfort of Marilyn's big house. Dismissing his proposal, Marilyn shouted at him to leave, pointing at the door. John, undeterred, hinted that the topic was not closed and left with a smirk. Glancing at the ring on Marilyn's finger, unnoticed by Marilyn in her anger and annoyance, John left, leaving the threat of a return hanging in the air. Despite trying to reassure herself, Marilyn remained uneasy. Her inner voice warned her not to expect anything good from John. And two, weeks passed with heightened anxiety at every knock on the door. Marilyn flinched even at passing neighbors or the barking of a neighbor's dog. On a rainy day, with thunder and lightning intensifying her worries, Marilyn faced a particularly insistent knock on the door. Though she suspected it was John, she decided not to open it. The uninvited guest persisted, knocking harder and harder. Armed with a vacuum cleaner stick, Marilyn opened the door threateningly, only to drop the weapon in shock. On the doorstep stood a drenched and frightened seven-year-old boy named Alan. He was crying and mumbling, seeking help. Marilyn, surprised and concerned, brought him inside, urging him to speak clearly. Alan explained that he and his father were returning from a fishing trip when his father suddenly fell ill. Fortunately, Daniel managed to stop the car and prevent an accident when he suffered an asthma attack. Alan, his son, sought help from the nearest house, which happened to be Marilyn's. Recognizing the symptoms of an asthma attack and realizing the inhaler was missing, Marilyn grabbed her first aid kit and rushed to the car with Alan. Arriving just in time, Marilyn provided first aid to Daniel, whose condition was critical. In heavy rain, driving further was impossible. So Marilyn invited Alan and his father to spend the night at her place. Trusting the stranger, Marilyn felt reassured by the man's noble features and intelligent eyes. A warm meal and hot tea helped Daniel recover. And the children quickly found common ground. Playing in the living room. As the adults conversed, Daniel shared his story. Revealing a similar theme of betrayal. Daniel had faced his own struggles after his wife, Karen, became irritable and dissatisfied following the birth of their son, Alan. Despite Daniel's efforts to improve their living situation by getting a second job and moving to a larger apartment, Karen remained discontent. She complained about being tired of staying at home and accused Daniel of not helping enough with their child. Daniel, torn between work and family responsibilities, asked his mother to visit Karen during weekends to provide childcare so that Karen could go out and meet her friends. One day, at her cousin's birthday celebration, Karen encountered a charming and affluent man who happened to own a beauty salon where the birthday girl worked as an administrator. Enchanted by his charisma and gallantry, Karen couldn't help but believe that such men only existed. 
in the realm of movies. To her delight, the man seemed equally interested in her. Thus began a whirlwind romance, leaving Karen infatuated. Almost daily, she sought her mother-in-law's assistance to sneak out of the house and spend a few hours with her newfound love. The man treated her to lavish dinners and bestowed luxurious gifts upon her. With each grand gesture, Karen's love for him intensified. Despite some hints dropped by Daniel's mother about Karen's frequent absences and the sudden appearance of expensive items, Daniel remained oblivious to any suspicions and even took offense at his mother's speculations. However, reality hit him hard soon enough. On a beautiful spring day, Daniel, finishing work early, hurried home with a bouquet of roses and Karen's favorite cake in tow, eager for a delightful family evening. To his surprise, Karen was nowhere to be found. Instead, his mother greeted him at the door, revealing that she had looked after Alan all day, and Karen had not returned home or responded to calls. Worried, Daniel attempted to reach his wife without success. Even Karen's sister and close friend were clueless about her whereabouts. Suddenly, he noticed a piece of notebook paper protruding from under the sofa cushion. It turned out to be a note from Karen straightforwardly confessing that she had fallen in love with another man and would now be living with him. She entrusted her son to her husband. As the new lover had no desire for children, the brief letter, written in neat calligraphic handwriting, concluded with a hopeful plea not to forbid her from seeing the child. After reading the note, Daniel angrily tore it up and slumped onto the sofa, crying bitterly, childishly hiding his face in his hands. His mother, without reading the note, understood the situation. She didn't attempt to comfort him but sighed heavily and shook her head. Filled with offense and anger, Daniel promptly filed for divorce. Firmly deciding to prevent his unfaithful wife from seeing their son and causing him emotional harm. In the following six months, Karen seemingly forgot about the baby. Enjoying a luxurious life with the money provided by her wealthy lover. However, her happiness was short-lived as she discovered that her chosen one was a notorious womanizer. Despite her naive belief in his love, he abruptly ended their relationship, leaving Karen with shattered dreams and nothing but a suitcase on the street. Her lover took away all the expensive gifts, jewelry, F, UR coat, and smartphone, leaving her with nothing to sell or live on. For the first time, she realized the value of having a wonderful Loving husband, hoping for forgiveness, Karen returned to her old apartment, only to find that Daniel had moved out long ago and was now living with his mother. Even at his mother's place, Karen faced rejection. Her former mother-in-law refused to let her in or show her the child. Karen sat on a bench near the entrance, waiting until late in the evening for Daniel to return from work. When she finally saw her ex-husband, she immediately jumped up and rushed to him with open arms. How dare you show up here and hug me? Go back where you came from. Karen. Daniel exclaimed. Pulling away from her. Please forgive me. I made a huge mistake. But now everything will be different. We'll live happily ever after, me. You. And Alan. Karen emotionally pleaded. Whether it was due to stress or genuine misunderstanding. She seemed sincerely confident that her husband would forgive her. And life would return to normal. However, Daniel was not willing to forgive. He looked at her with a scornful gaze. Making it clear that there would be no second chance. He swiftly approached the entrance. Turned around. And said. Don't you dare come here again. It was at that moment that Karen realized the true tragedy of her situation. She had lost her beautiful. Affluent life with her lover. And now, she had also lost her family. Left with nothing. She had no choice but to return to her parents' house. However, they were not pleased with her and couldn't forgive her for her disgrace. While they didn't throw her out, they didn't show much hospitality either. The next day, Karen's mother called her into the kitchen for a serious conversation. Don't think you can freeload off us like you did with your naive husband. That won't work with us. And you won't get our pension. Find a job. Karen's mother sternly warned. Well, what am I going to do? I never worked after marriage. Replied Karen. Confused. You're no use at all. 
I'll talk to my neighbor. Maybe she'll help you find a job as a letter carrier or courier. The working days became a harsh trial for Karen, who had never worked a day in her life and had no plans to do so. The size of her salary was a shock. And she couldn't fathom how to live on such money. Every day, the reality sank in that her life probably wouldn't improve. The thought of spending the rest of her life in her parents' apartment, living from paycheck to paycheck, led her to despair. And she turned to alcohol, starting with a bottle of beer after work. She eventually switched to stronger drinks. Her boss noticed her addiction and fired her to avoid problems with parcels. This blow shattered Karen. And she began to drink excessively. Her parents tried to help by taking her to doctors. But it was futile. She continued to drink and had an affair with a neighbor who was also an alcoholic and frequently abused her in drunken rages. One day, the man pushed Karen so hard that she hit her head on the corner of the closet and died instantly. Daniel, her former husband, took care of all the funeral expenses. Feeling partly responsible for her tragic end, he wondered if things might have been different if he hadn't driven her away so cruelly. The boy, Alan, grew up with the idea that his mother, who loved him very much, died of a serious illness. His father did everything to ensure Alan had attention and material wealth. Daniel worked hard to build a successful business to pass on to his son by inheritance. During a conversation with Marilyn, Daniel's mother, she shared her story. The interlocutors didn't notice how time flew by. And it began to get light. They even forgot about the children. Amy and Alan. Who had fallen asleep playing late in the living room. Waiting for the kids to wake up. Marilyn prepared a delicious hearty breakfast with country products. Daniel thanked his savior and left with his son. Leaving Marilyn to contemplate the events she had heard for a long time. Life in the village continued as usual for her. With a multitude of tasks at the nursing station and household chores that overshadowed the disturbing thoughts caused by her ex-husband's visit. Somehow, Marilyn convinced herself that John's threats were nothing and that he would never return. If he really meant to do something, he would have done it by now. And even if he comes, what can he do to me? Nothing. Marilyn pondered. Calming herself. She recalled her recent guests with warmth and Amy frequently asked about her new friend with whom they played so cheerfully. Will Alan come to us? Amy inquired. But Marilyn had nothing to say to her daughter. She was convinced that she would never meet Daniel and his son again, as they hadn't discussed it or exchanged phone numbers. Yet, Marilyn admitted to herself that she wouldn't mind reconnecting with the new acquaintance because he seemed like a good man and an interesting conversationalist. One nigh. T. Marilyn had a troubling dream. In it, someone chased her down a long, dark corridor, attempting to grab her with huge, hairy hands adorned with long, dirty nails. The pursuer tried to remove a precious ring from her finger, but it wouldn't budge. The dream left Marilyn in horror, and she woke up in the moonlit night filled with an unsettling light that added to her anxiety. Unable to shake off the unpleasant dream, Marilyn tossed and turned in bed until morning, unable to find rest. While not superstitious and generally not a believer in dreams or omens, this particular nightmare disturbed her greatly. Every morning, she put on her grandmother's ring, left in the bedside table drawer overnight. However, this time, a strange feeling made Marilyn take off the ring, suddenly considering it frivolous to walk around the village wearing such jewelry. I'll hide it away in the room, thought Marilyn, and she placed her grandmother's ring in the large chest that stood in the room. This chest was not only locked with a key but also had a double bottom, concealing all the most valuable things, documents, money, gold earrings she hadn't worn since her youth, and a box with a ring. Marilyn decided to return her family heirloom to its rightful place, mentally thanking herself for not ignoring the bad premonition. Looking at the clock, Marilyn realized it was time to wake up her daughter and prepare breakfast. While Amy was busy in the kitchen, the neighbor's dog suddenly barked loudly. Marilyn, accustomed to these sounds, usually paid no attention, as the dog reacted aggressively to almost every rustle. However, today, the animal behaved differently. Growling menacingly, it literally tore off the chain, 
Curious. Marilyn decided to go outside and see what was going on. The dog was barking not towards the street but towards Marilyn's yard. All bristled. Teeth bared. And pulling the chain with all its might. Seemingly pointing to the far corner of the neighbor's garden. Thinking the dog might have spotted a cat. Marilyn went around the yard just in case. She briefly scanned the surroundings but saw no signs of intruders. For a moment. She thought she heard rustling on the side of the patio. But upon investigation. There was no one there. Returning to her work. Marilyn continued her tasks. About an hour later. She and Amy left the house on the way to kindergarten. However. Amy suddenly remembered that she had forgotten the acorn craft at home. Causing her to burst into tears. Mother and daughter had to turn back. Even though they had already traveled two-thirds of the way. Entering the yard again. Marilyn noticed that the door to the chest in her room was ajar. She wondered if she had forgotten to close it but realized as she approached that the lock was not just cracked but literally broken. As if someone had chopped it with an axe. At that moment. John ran out of the house. Looking unrecognizable with anger. Where's the ring? He shouted upon seeing his ex-wife and daughter standing in front of the house. Visibly frightened. It turned out that the barking of the neighbor's dog that morning was not in vain. The pet had immediately sensed someone sneaking into the neighbor's territory. John had climbed over the fence from the backyard to remain unnoticed and had hidden behind the patio. Waiting for a convenient moment to enter their house. When Marilyn went out into the yard at the sound of the barking dog. John had sneaked into the cellar through the ajar door. He watched Marilyn carefully and noticed that she was not wearing the ring he had come for. His plan was to wait until she left and then search the house. Finding the ring was vital to him. He had once again lost badly at cards and owed money to dangerous bandits who had threatened to kill him if he didn't repay the debt. His parents couldn't help him. Having already sold everything they could. And the only remaining valuable item was the apartment. John had pleaded with his parents to sell the apartment in the center of the city and buy something smaller. Why do you need this big apartment in your old age? Buy yourselves a one-bedroom and live happily. Is an apartment more valuable to you than your own son? He had begged. However. His parents had lost patience. Kicked him out. And changed the locks to prevent him from entering and taking away whatever remained. Left without hope. John suddenly remembered the luxurious gold ring with a ruby that he had seen on his ex-wife's finger. Now. With Marilyn and Amy gone to daycare. He immediately ran out of his hiding place and began searching. After testing the old wooden door's reliability, John grabbed an axe from the backyard and struck the lock on the first try. Breaking the barrier, he forcefully entered the house to search for the ring. John turned out closets, looked under mattresses, moved furniture, and rummaged through cans of cereal and flour, hoping to find the jewel. But to no avail. He had no idea where the stash was. Even. Breaking open the lock of the massive wooden chest with the blow of an axe revealed only his grandmother's old tablecloths. Blankets. And an album of old photographs. He was very close to his cherished goal. But fortunately. He had no idea about it. Has she sold it? But she couldn't have spent the money so quickly. He thought. With these thoughts. He ran out of the house. Heading towards his last hope. The attic. Planning to climb using the long ladder on the wall. He came face to face with Marilyn and his daughter. Who had returned home for a handmade craft. Taken by surprise. The robber was initially confused. Realizing he had nothing more to lose. He decided to take extreme measures. Roughly grabbing Marilyn and Amy. He dragged them into the house. Marilyn tried to scream and call for help. But John looked so threatening that she had a lump in her throat. Closing the door behind him. John demanded that his ex-wife give him the ring. Confess. Where did you hide the ring? Speak quickly. Don't try my patience. He threatened. What ring? I don't have any ring. Marilyn justified herself. Determined not to hand over the valuable heirloom. Don't pretend. I saw it on your finger last time. It's just costume jewelry from the local store. I lost it somewhere in the garden a long time ago. She lied. Thinking on her feet. Why are you playing games with me? I'm not an idiot. I know there's gold there. 
probably ten grams of gold and a ruby the size of my fist. Give it to me. Or else we'll both be in trouble. John warned. Suddenly. He ran out to the garage and returned with a can of gasoline for the lawnmower. I have nothing to lose. If you don't give me the ring, I'll set the house on fire. And we'll all die together. He shouted in his crazed state. Marilyn realized he was not joking. She went to the bedroom. Took out her grandmother's jewelry box. Which was dear to her heart. And gave it to her ex-husband. Despite the pain of parting with the precious gift. The safety of her child and her own life took precedence over any jewelry. After receiving what he wanted. John rushed to the exit. However. On the way to the gate. He suddenly stopped. Overcome by a sudden urge to cause more trouble for his ex-spouse. Whom he blamed for all his problems. He rushed back into the house. Where the shocked Marilyn looked at the chaos that had reigned in her cozy home. Trying to assess the scale of the damage. He roughly pushed Marilyn into the bedroom and locked the room from the outside. Then. He grabbed a crying Amy by the arms and dragged her towards the exit. In truth. He didn't even know where he would go with his daughter or what he would do with her because he didn't actually need her. But the main thing was. Despite Marilyn. He was least concerned about his child's feelings and fate. Meanwhile. Marilyn was banging on the door. Threatening to call the police. John realized she wouldn't stay locked forever. And he feared she would escape. Report him. And get him into trouble. Realizing this. He decided to carry out his threats. However. He wasn't going to harm the little girl. So he simply locked her in the barn to prevent her from disturbing him or attracting the attention of neighbors with her screams. John then grabbed a can of gasoline and started pouring the flammable liquid on the walls of the house. Consumed by anger and the process. Unaware of the unfolding danger. A car drove up to the yard. Fortunately for Marilyn and her daughter. Daniel and his son came to visit them to express gratitude once again for their rescue. Witnessing this terrible scene. Daniel disarmed John with the first log he could find. Fifteen minutes later. The district police arrived. And the intruder was detained. The valuable ring was returned to its rightful owner. And John was sent to prison for robbery and the attempted murder of his ex-wife. Marilyn never saw him again or heard anything about him. And she wasn't interested at all. She now had a new life that had no place for the ghost of the past. Marilyn and Daniel began a romance. And Amy and Alan were thrilled that their parents were together and going to get married. Creating a big family. At the wedding. Marilyn put on her grandmother's ring and never took it off again. Now she was sure that the family relic had brought her the long-awaited happiness. Well. That's all for today's story. If you like it. Please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.